Hello, world history students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 30, Section 1, World War II Begins. And to start with, I want to talk a little bit about our teams here. You know, we, we know that in World War I, alliances were one of the, the factors that kind of started this war, but we still have alliances in World War II. Uh, and a lot of times we refer to them as either the Allies or the Axis powers. So when we talk about the Allies, this would include Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and eventually the United States, which looks a little familiar if you remember your World War I allies. Uh, when we talk about the Axis powers, we're talking about Germany, Italy, and Japan. And some of this was in the works for some time. Uh, if you remember uh, when we were talking a little bit about the Far East, we talked about the anti uh, common turn pact or treaty that was signed really that that kind of brings forth the the axis powers sometimes known as the tripartite pact but needless to say these are our teams that are going to be playing in this war so let's talk a little bit about how this all kind of starts uh, when hitler took control of germany starting in 1933 he began to rebuild germany's military and its economy and part of this is because of the fact that with the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was required to kind of demobilize or to demilitarize themselves. They were ordered to get rid of their U-boats. They were uh, downsized as far as the size of their standing army. Uh, aircraft were, you know, for the most part, kind of taken out of commission. So when Hitler comes to power, uh, that's going to be a big priority. He wants to rearm himself. Uh, and as a result of that, that puts a lot of people back to work in the economy. This was achieved through government spending and public works programs to help reduce the unemployment. But much of the spending, obviously, was spent on rearmament of the military. So uh, if you take a look at the, the graph in the middle here, uh, you can kind of see what was happening with unemployment during the, the time of the 1930s. Uh, just so you know, 1932, that's about the time when um, Franklin Roosevelt is elected president. 1933 is about the time that Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany. And really starting in 32, things start declining as far as the number of unemployment or unemployees. Uh, when you talk about defense spending, uh, this is kind of an interesting graph to look at or a chart to look at. Uh, if you uh, look a little further down on the list, you'll see Germany, Italy, and Japan. Uh, 1933 was the year that Hitler becomes chancellor. Between 33 and 1934, uh, you can see that the amount of money being spent on the military definitely goes up, but it booms, it, it skyrockets between 1934 and 35, and it just keeps growing from that point on. Compare that to the United States or Great Britain, and we're a little bit behind. Uh, you know, starting in 33, the United States had more money being spent on the military than Germany, but, you know, it isn't going to take very long less than a year uh, for the Germans to outspend us. And certainly, you know, if you look at what we're doing uh, through the course of 1933 through 1938, we're really not uh, keeping up. And the same could be said with the other allies, maybe with the exception of the Soviet Union. So Germany expanded in the late 1930s when it took over German-speaking Austria and a Czech region known as the Sudetenland. Uh, this is a region that kind of borders Germany, which we'll take a look at on a map here in a second. Uh, but it has a very large German-speaking population. And one of the things that Hitler wanted to do is to uh, to bring back those German-speaking people back into the German Empire. And thus, he, he goes after that. Going back to talking about rearmament, uh, Hitler understood that if he wanted to protect his country and to dominate Europe, uh, he was going to need to build more submarines and warships. And part of this was to stop the spread of communism, but it also is to keep up pace uh, with the British Empire. The French and the British, um, when it came time for Hitler to want to seek land, um, 
For the most part, they did not stand in the way of Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland in 1938. This whole policy was known as appeasement. Uh, the man that you see photographed with Adolf Hitler in this photo is a man named Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain was the prime minister of Great Britain, uh, kind of leading into World War I or World War II. And he went to Munich uh, to meet with Hitler and actually Benito Mussolini. And this is uh, little meeting was known as the Munich Conference. And it's at that conference that Hitler lays out his plans that he wanted to bring back the Sudetenland. And he basically said that once I take that, there won't be any more fighting. Chamberlain believed it. And they got it signed into a little contract. Chamberlain goes back home and says, we have peace in our times. And within a year, we have the start of World War II. Uh, Hitler, for the most part, you know, he was he understood that the British and the French, um, in his opinion, were very weak uh, because they weren't going to stand up against him. And thus he was going to take that and use that as his advantage. So when we talk about land that the Axis powers were able to gain in Europe, uh, those regions uh, that were basically held by the Axis power, if you look at uh, Germany, this would include Germany. And uh, starting in 1936, uh, what is known as the Rhineland or um, Alance Lorraine, which is a, a territory that had been fought over by the, the British, or not the British, the Germans and the, the French for a long period of time. But um, following World War I, French troops occupied this region. And at some point in time, Hitler obviously is going to go back and reoccupy it. Uh, you can take a look at Austria. Uh, obviously, the, the Germans were welcomed with open arms by Austrian Nazis in 1938. And that Sudetenland, which if you look at Czechoslovakia, the little dotted line, that is the region that Hitler was wanting to um, to occupy. But eventually, he's going to occupy the whole nation. So leading into uh, the Second World War, uh, Hitler's got his eyes focused on Poland. And not only does he have that, but the Soviet Union is also kind of watching this because they have some desires to, to take Poland too. And thus, in August of 1939, you have what is known as the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Uh, this was a an agreement that was negotiated in secrecy between the Nazis and the, the Soviets. And the goal was to take Poland, split it in half. Everything that was to the east of, let's say, Warsaw, Poland, uh, would be in the hands of the Soviets. Anything to the west would be in the hands of the Germans. And thus, Poland would cease to exist. And they signed this. And literally, um, before the ink dried, the Nazis invaded Poland, starting World War II on September 1st. 1939, uh, when the Germans invaded Poland following um, the massing of German troops along the western border of Poland. And as a result, Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain, who was the prime minister of Great Britain, uh, kind of had to eat his words. And as a result, he is going to be ousted as prime minister uh, within a short period of time because of the fact that uh, Great Britain now is going to have to stand up for itself and support its allies. And unfortunately for Chamberlain, that means he's out of work. All right. So between 1939, after the surrender of Poland in October, and till about the time of May or early spring 1940, uh, you have a period of time when the British and the French had declared war on Germany uh, and nothing was going on. And sometimes this period of time is known as the phony war. Starting in May or the late, or the spring of 1940, Hitler uh, decides to move troops to the west, and he invades Pol or Belgium, uh, Holland, Luxembourg. Eventually, that's going to move towards Denmark, uh, and this is all going to be uh, kind of the the real catalyst of the war in the west. But that period of time that is kind of known as the phony war kind of got a nickname. 
And this goes back to uh, Winston Churchill, and he called it the Sitzkrieg. Uh, Blitzkrieg, if you remember any of your vocab terms, is this idea of lightning warfare, which is really what the Germans were using in Poland. Uh, eventually, they were going to use it against France, but as we're waiting for that to happen, and as both sides are arming themselves, we've got this kind of boring period of time known as the Sitzkrieg. All right, thank you very much.